Hi everyone and welcome to OR Today webinars. We have a great presentation for you today featuring Nancy Fellows, Senior Clinical Education Consultant of Advanced Sterilization Products. Nancy will discuss best practices aligned with terminal sterilization of surgical and medical instrumentation, review the current and existing position of spalding classification, and identify current sterilization and modalities available in the healthcare environment. OR Today would like to thank our sponsor, Advanced Sterilization Products. Every day, millions of people around the world visit a healthcare facility. The care and handling of instruments used to treat patients is vital to their, to their health outcome, and there is no room for error. ASP is a leader in infection, infection prevention dedicated to creating the products, solutions, and processes needed by practitioners to protect patients during their most critical moments. They are committed to continuously advancing infection prevention technologies that healthcare depends upon. Above all, they put patients first. They are advanced sterilization products. For more information, please visit ASP.com. For nearly 20 years, OR Today has provided perioperative and SPD professionals with up-to-date news and information about their profession. Our monthly magazine aims to educate readers about new guidelines, techniques, and equipment, as well as practical information for career building, problem solving, and overall well-being. To receive your free subscription to our magazine, please visit ortoday.com slash subscribe. Today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education hour by the State of California Board of Registered Nursing. You can obtain your certificate by completing today's post-webinar survey. More details on this at the end of today's webinar. We'll wrap up today's presentation with a live Q&A. You can submit your questions anytime during the webinar by using the questions feature on the webinar dashboard. We'll get through as many attendee questions as time allows. As I mentioned earlier, our presenter today is Nancy Fellows. Nancy, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you, Jennifer. And as Jennifer mentioned, ASP Advanced Sterilization Products is the sponsor of this program. Many times people may think that understanding the principles of reprocessing is something that everybody knows, but there are so many new people that are coming to the SPD departments in the operating room. Sometimes I think it's important to get back to the basics. And as Jennifer mentioned, the objectives today are to identify best practice aligned with terminal sterilization, discuss balding classification, and then we will review current sterilization modalities. When one has a conversation concerning evidence-based practice and best practice, I often think of those in healthcare that came before us. Historically, the knowledge that was imparted by Florence Nightingale by transforming nursing into a profession. Joseph Lister, a pioneer of antiseptic surgery, Louis Pasteur, who was credited for saving millions of lives through the development of vaccines such as rabies, anthrax, and cholera, as well as Sir Alexander Fleming, a Scottish researcher who was credited with discovery of penicillin back in 1928. They all provided or created the foundation for best practice through evidence. But as modern medicine progressed, those providing care began to question what or where is the evidence that spearheads best practice today? How does one know that what one is doing, the cause, will provide the best effect, which will lead a patient to a safe and positive outcome? We know that evidence-based practice is essential to improving patient care by promoting decisions based on evidence and comprehensive research rather than just an opinion. 
AORN, the Association of Perioperative Registered Nurses guidelines, rate their recommendations on supporting evidence. When healthcare facilities and departments seek to create or update their policies and procedures, they look to esteemed and highly regarded institutions that shifted over time to evidence that is proven to drive best practice until something better is found. There are several areas where best practices are aligned with reprocessing medical and surgical instrumentation. Point of use, following manufacturer's written IFU, instruction for use, decontamination and cleaning, drying, inspecting, assembling or disassembling, packaging, adhering and reviewing to process monitors, which I'll speak to a little later in the presentation, documentation, whether it's manual or electronically, and finally storage. So where does the reprocessing cycle begin? The cycle of reprocessing begins at the point of use. Whomever is handling or utilizing an instrument has the responsibility to prevent the formation of biofilm or bacteria adhering to the surface of the instrument. And this is particularly important in the operating room. The scrub personnel should remove gross soil, which could be blood, bile, or tissue, from instruments using a sterile sponge moistened with sterile water, as well as irrigate lumens on the surgical field. This also assists in handling instrumentation back to a surgeon for their use and visualization. At the point of use, instruments should never be cleaned with saline. We all know that saline is a mixture of salt and water. Salt is highly corrosive to instrumentation, which may eventually cause staining. Staining leads to pitting, and pitting can lead to rusting. Decontamination and cleaning should occur as soon as possible after instrumentation and equipment has been used. Damaged instrumentation affects decontamination and cleaning, sterilization efficacy, and also functionality. Repair and replacement of instruments is costly for any department. When instrumentation is used for medical or surgical procedures, or even when they're handled for teaching and demonstration purposes, they are considered contaminated and should be contained during transport from the point of use to be decontaminated and cleaned. Containment of contaminated devices is a safety issue so that no personnel will come in contact with contaminated items. Soiled instrumentation must be transported in a closed container. It should be leak proof, we can't use any pillowcases today. Puncture resistant, it must contain all contents. So if it's a tray of instruments, all the instruments, whether they were used or not, need to be part of that containment system. And then labeled as biohazard, which is generally noted with a red color or tag, where clean is denoted with a green color or tag. As mentioned, instrumentation is contained and transported to be decontaminated and cleaned. It is important that healthcare organizations create policies and procedures for all methods of decontamination and cleaning using recommended guidelines and standards from respected organizations using evidence-based practices. Besides guidelines and standards, manufacturers' IFUs need to be followed and be easily accessible for reference. So they shouldn't be locked up in a manager's office where at the end of the day, someone might need it and they can't get to it. Also, regulatory agents usually inquire where these are kept. Contaminated and clean instrumentation should be separated, preventing cross-contamination and safeguarding personnel. There should be dedicated ingress and egress from the dirty side to the clean side of the room or department. And personnel assigned to the decontamination task should always wear appropriate PPE, personal protective equipment, including fluid resistant gown with sleeves, utility gloves that extend beyond the cuff of the gown, 
mask and eye protection or a full face shield and shoe and boot covers. Decontamination and cleaning go hand in hand using water with detergents or enzymatic products. Regarding manual cleaning, friction is required. Cleaning removes bio burden or bacteria from an object. In the case of the operating room and surgical instruments, this could be blood, secretions, bile, feces, urine, or tissue. Thorough cleaning is required before high level disinfection or sterilization because inorganic or organic material left on the surface of instruments will interfere with the efficacy of disinfection or sterilization. And remember, enzymatic detergents have a shelf life or an expiration date. They should be used in the proper concentration and the device needs to be subjected to the solution for the amount of time prescribed in the IFU, followed by thorough rinsing and drying of the device. Of course, we are accustomed to manual and automatic cleaning, but remember, proper cleaning will effectively reduce the number of microorganisms on contaminated devices. Working through the steps of repositing, we have already reviewed point of use cleaning, transporting contaminated instruments, decontamination and cleaning. We now are now ready to discuss preparation of the instruments that may be high level disinfected or terminally sterilized. Once properly cleaned, items should be dried using a lint-free cloth, inspected for cleanliness or any damage. If damaged, the item should be tagged, identified, taken out of circulation for repair or replacement. Remember, any item that is not cleaned properly will place a patient at risk for cross-contamination that could result in injury or a surgical site infection. And surgical site infections are still listed as one of the top five hospital acquired infections. And this could adversely affect reimbursement to the hospital system. Items should be assembled or disassembled and packaged accordingly to the manufacturer's IFU for the sterilization modality that is going to be used. Again, if any item has not been cleaned properly, then disinfection or sterilization cannot be achieved. So let's talk about Spalding classification. Spalding classification is not new. It has stood the test of time and has been incorporated into our practice aligned with disinfection and sterilization since the 1950s. Dr. Earl Spaulding developed a system for disinfection and sterilization of devices, believing that instruments and equipment should be cleaned and reprocessed according to the risk associated with their intended clinical use. The classification you see here is critical. Instrumentation that enters a sterile cavity or vascular system of the body must be sterilized, and certainly that would be our surgical instruments. Unlike instrumentation used inside the sterile cavity of the body, semi-critical instrumentation comes in contact with mucous membranes or non-intact skin. Examples including respiratory and anesthesia equipment, such as laryngoscope blades, urology instrumentation, cystoscopes and ureteroscopes, and some GI scopes as well. The lowest risk items in terms of infection are considered non-critical. They may or may not come in contact with intact skin. Examples here would include patient care items such as blood pressure cuffs and monitors, wheelchairs, and IV pumps. Spalding classification has proved an exceptional multi-decade standard for device reprocessing. However, of late, it has come under scrutiny because of drug-resistant organisms, the many types of disinfectants that may be ineffective against microorganisms of today, as well as the design of a specific instrumentation and endoscopes.
Aligned with questioning the modern validity of Spalding classification, there is more and more thought concerning high-level disinfection versus sterilization, or why not just sterilization? Key organizations such as AMI, the Association for the Advancement of Medical Information, and AORN have begun to shift to sterilization. AORN states, items that are classified as semi-critical, such as endoscopes, should be sterilized whenever possible and undergo high-level disinfection at a minimum if sterilization is not possible. Some say if a reusable semi-critical device has instructions from the manufacturer that the device can be reprocessed by high-level disinfection, but also sterilization, the thought or trend is to elevate one's practice to sterilization. Other comments that reusable semi-critical devices process in high-level disinfection present a higher risk of disease transmission. Remember, HLD kills all bacteria, but not spores. Sterilization is the absence of spores, all living organisms. The healthcare facility may, the healthcare facility may want to do a risk assessment to determine whether semi-critical items should be sterilized. Besides standards and guidelines that we all seek for developing our policies and procedures to implement best practice, there are also regulatory guidelines as well. One is HICPAC. This is the Healthcare Infection Control Practices Advisory Committee that provides advice and guidelines to the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, HHS related to the detection and prevention of healthcare or hospital-associated infections. HICPEC guidelines are recommended on the basis of scientific evidence, theoretical rationale, applicability, potential economic impact, and existing national and state regulations, all to serve as a foundation for healthcare safety across, across all settings. Let's use this example of high-level disinfection versus terminal sterilization when processing a laryngoscope blade identified as a semi-critical device. First, let me describe what is meant by a category 1A rank by HICPAC. The description strongly recommended for implementation and strongly supported by well-designed experimental, clinical, and epidemiological studies. The guidelines for preventing healthcare associated pneumonia state thoroughly clean all equipment and devices to sterilize or disinfect, category 1A. Whenever possible, use steam sterilization for processing semi critical devices that come into contact or indirect contact with mucous membranes of the respiratory system. And third, use low temperature sterilization for heat and moisture sensitive devices, category 1A. Joint commissioners will also evaluate the sterilization modality that was used, packaging that would prevent recontamination and storage that would prevent recontamination as well. I'm sure that many of you that are listening today reprocess urology urology instrumentation, such as our cystoscopes and ureteroscopes. A common procedure, the cystoscopy, allowing a physician to examine the bladder can be performed in a multiple of areas, a doctor's office, a clinic, ambulatory surgery center, or a main hospital operating room. Do you think reprocessing of the cystoscope is the same in all of these places? It is not. For Spalding classification, a cystoscope is a semi-critical device, so high-level disinfection is appropriate. However, HICPAC and the CDC state, if a manufacturer has written instructions that identify that a, that a device can be high-level disinfected or sterilized, one should take their practice to a higher level and sterilize the device. So here's a question. 
Should patients have a sterilized scope used on them for their procedure if it is scheduled in the morning, but afternoon patients get scopes that have been HLD because there's not enough inventory or there are time constraints? Something to surely think about. Healthcare facilities should establish a standard of practice that can achieve delivery of the same level of care to all of our patients. So let's shift to sterilization. As mentioned before, high level disinfection kills bacteria, but not spores. Well, it might kill some spores that are weak. However, sterilization destroys all microorganisms. Sterilization is defined in a law of reduction as 10 to the negative six and is referred to as SAL, sterility assurance level, or a probability of a spore surviving after the sterilization process of being one in one million. Obviously, there is no one perfect sterilizer that can meet the needs of our departments to sterilize all the different types of instrumentation and material that they are made of that we use on a daily basis. Years ago, it was different as we did not have such high-tech instrumentation that are used on surgical procedures today. When I started in the operating room, everything was stainless steel. So let us review. Steam sterilization has been around for centuries. Charles Chamberlain, a pupil of Louis Pasteur, developed the first pressure steam sterilized sterilizer or autoclave in 1876. That was nearly 150 years ago. There are certainly advantages and disadvantages to using steam sterilization. Advantages, it's widely used, is very dependable. It's non-toxic and inexpensive. It uses water. It is rapidly microbiocidal and sporocidal and can penetrate fabrics such as cotton and cotton and polyester, um, especially for departments that are still wrapping some of their towels or sets in fabric. The disadvantages, depending on the quality of stainless steel instrumentation and the quality of water, this process may be corrosive to instrumentation. It's combustion of lubricants, it can cause a reduction or damage to the ability of transmitting light associated with laryngoscope blades and lighted retractors if they're being processed in steam sterilization. And it cannot support instrumentation that needs to be processed in low temperature or moisture free environments due to the material and adhesives that are used in those instruments. When we look to sterilization parameters, there are four associated with steam sterilization. The first, the quality of water that is converted to steam. Water quality is different in different parts of the United States. In fact, water quality is also uh, affected by the seasons, by construction on a hospital site or nearby. And tap water contains minerals including calcium, magnesium, potassium, and iron. Hard water has a higher mineral content. Pressure, specific to the sterilizer to obtain the high temperature needed to kill microorganisms. The temperature we know runs between 250 to 270 degrees Fahrenheit. And lastly, time that must be maintained to kill the microorganisms. With the combination of these parameters, moist heat destroys microorganisms by coagulation and breaking up of the bacterial molecules. Steam sterilization can be used on heat and moisture resistant instrumentation, whether they are critical or non-critical devices. Ah, the ever lasting flash sterilization, which many of us still call it that, even though we know that immediate use steam sterilization is the preferred term today. As it is referred to, it is a process that has been used forever, yet overused at times. This process has always been acceptable in urgent situations, but not to be used for purposes of convenience or because one does not have enough inventory. 
Historically, this process was not recommended due to the lack of biological monitoring and also absence or lack of documentation. Items processed by IUSS should be decontaminated and cleaned following department protocol, placed in a rigid container, not on the shelf or of the rack of the sterilizer that is intended for this particular cycle, used immediately, and in terms of documentation, the item must be identified as IUSS. So let's shift from high temperature sterilization to low temperature sterilization. Ethylene oxide or ETO has been used for many decades. This type of sterilization provided the means to sterilize items that could not be processed in heat sensitive or moisture environments. Parameters of ETO include the gas concentration, the temperature ranging from 99 to 145 degrees Fahrenheit compared to 270 in steam, the, necess the necessity for relative humidity, and exposure times for sterilization can range from one to six hours with eight to 12 hours of aeration. So the total time could be anywhere from 12 or more than 20 hours. The disadvantages of using ETO sterilization are really quite paramount. The lengthy cycle time, departments don't have the luxury of having a huge inventory of instruments to have them locked up in an ETO system for this type of time. Cost, it's definitely higher than steam sterilization where we use water. It is an unstable compound that catches fire easily or explodes. Therefore, cylinders should be stored in explosive proof containers. It is one of the most hazardous of the top 25 chemicals produced in the United States. There is documentation that speaks to the potential hazard to staff and patients, and it is known as a human carcinogen. It was used on the battlefield in World War II. But to be fair, there are advantages to using ETO sterilization. It can sterilize heat and moisture sensitive instrumentation and is used in research to sterilize items that have yet to be cleared by the FDA. And I think I must have moved to that slide as I was speaking to that. I apologize. The ever popular use of parasitic, parasitic acid sterilization. Parasitic acid is defined by the FDA as a disinfectant and a sterilant. However, when sterilant residue is rinsed from the items with filtered potable or tap water, the item is not considered sterile. I mentioned earlier the impurities in tap water. When using parasitic acid, remember, it is an oxidizing agent. It is less stable than glutaraldehyde. It can be corrosive and has a strong vinegar-like odor. Processing temperatures between 115 and 131 degrees Fahrenheit. It may cause serious eye and skin damage. It should be used in a well-ventilated area, downing proper PPE. And due to its oxidative nature, can cause cosmetic discoloration of materials. And it is considered a just-in-time process where items are not wrapped for terminal sterilization. Low temperature sterilization technology is another low temperature methodology that can be used. It is with hydrogen peroxide gas plasma. In some respects, this is considered new technology when it is matched up to the timeline of steam autoclave and ETO. However, gas plasma sterilization has been marketed and used for nearly 30 years now. The technology uses hydrogen peroxide that is vaporized and diffused throughout the sterilizer chamber. An electrical field is created by a radio frequency force to create gas plasma. This process process inactivates microorganisms by a combination of hydrogen peroxide gas and radicals. When the radio frequency is turned off, the molecules do not recombine to hydrogen peroxide. The resultant products are oxygen 
in water vapor or humidity. And this is a safety feature. The advantage of low temperature hydrogen peroxide sterilization include being able to process heat and moisture sensitive instrumentation. It is compatible with stainless steel. As mentioned, processed byproducts are oxygen and water vapor. There are varying cycle times with this technology, 24 to 64 minutes, and the temperature is less than 131 degrees Fahrenheit during processing. One of the disadvantages of low temperature gas plasma, it cannot use packaging material made of cellulose, which is paper or linen. Another low temperature sterilization technology is vaporized hydrogen peroxide, VHP. There are two methods of delivering, of delivery with this technology. One is a use of a deep vacuum to pull liquid hydrogen peroxide from a disposable cassette through a heated vaporizer and then followed by vaporization into the chamber of the sterilizer. Or the other method is delivery is the flow through approach in which VHP is carried into the chamber of the sterilizer by a carrier gas such as air or oxygen using negative pressure or a vacuum using positive pressure. The advantages of this type of technology include being able to process heat and moisture sensitive instrumentation. It has a wide range of material compatibility, the rapid cycle times being between 30 and 40 minutes. The disadvantage include cellulose packaging, such not being able to use cellulose packaging such as paper or linen, and also nylon will become brittle. The last sterilization modality uh, I would like to touch on is low temperature ozone sterilization. Ozone has, ozone has been used as a drinking water disinfectant. Ozone is produced when O2 is energized and split into two monoatomic O1 molecules. A monoatomic O1 molecule collides with an O2 molecule to form ozone or O3. This additional oxygen atom makes ozone a powerful oxidant that destroys microorganisms. However, this process is highly unstable. Compared to other modalities we have reviewed, ozone parameters include temperatures 86 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Cycle times vary from 46 minutes to as much as four hours and 15 minutes. The facility must use USP grade oxygen, steam quality water and electricity. The sterile passes through a catalytic converter before exhausted into the environment. And it has strong oxidizing properties which may damage instrumentation. There are several monitors we observe during sterilization. Chemical indicators and tape, mechanical printouts, maintaining records or files on preventive maintenance of the sterilizer. But the biological indicator and process challenging device are the most critical. I always look at monitors like a pie with different pieces to it. Some of the pieces are tinier and some are larger. The BI is the largest of the, of the monitors. BIs are the only sterilization process monitoring device that provides a direct measurement of the lethality of the process. And as always, BI should be used following the manufacturer's written instructions for use, the IFU. Using a process challenge device takes our practice to the next level. As a challenge test pack containing a BI and a chemical indicator, a PCD is used to assess the effective performance of the sterilization process by providing a challenge to that process that is equal to or greater than the most challenging item in the load. And it's rare, if ever, that our cycles are duplicated with the same trays and packaging and the devices over and over again. Amy Standard 58 states that a PCD should be used daily, but preferably in every sterilization cycle. As mentioned previously, healthcare facilities, 
and sterile processing departments should establish a standard of care that can achieve delivery of the same level of care for all patients. Certainly a discussion that should be had concerning every load monitoring. Documentation demonstrates compliance with regulatory and accrediting requirements and identifies trends for quality improvement opportunities. We all document what we do, but how good is our documentation aligned with our practices? For guidelines, the following information minimally should be recorded either in paper or in electronic log systems. The load or cycle number, the, the specific contents of a load, and not a package of widgets that say it belongs to the respiratory department. The exposure time and temperature of the sterilization chamber, operator ID, the results of the BI or PCD leaning toward every load monitor so that practice is consistent for each cycle processed. Responsive chemical indicators if applicable, applicable, but remember chemical indicators and tape do not tell us if something is sterile. It is the first visual that the items have been subjected to the sterilant. And finally, make sure that any maintenance performed on the sterilizer is documented and filed ensuring peak performance of that equipment. There are many things to consider when selecting a sterilizer. Many departments have not replaced this equipment for years, and many features have changed. Departments should never, departments should review how best this purchase will best fit their needs. How will it fit in the footprint of the department, whether the department is old, being renovated, or new? Are there any space constraints? Device and material compatibility of current instrumentation and future purchases should be considered as well. Ease of installation, cycle parameters, and education for all operators. Are there any environmental considerations? What about future upgrades to maximize the purchase of a new sterilizer? And internet capabilities for communication and electronic documentation. Gosh, I've shared a lot of information with you, some of which you are familiar, but other new ideas and considerations. Remember, those reprocessing surgical instrumentation, whether in the operating room or department or sterile processing, every patient, whether direct or indirect care, deserves quality care with instruments and devices that have been properly reprocessed, cleaned, inspected, high level disinfected or sterilized. As reprocessing techniques and instrumentation continue to advance, it is critical that all of us remain vigilant and educated of the distinction between semi-critical and critical devices as identified in Spalding classification. Following manufacturer's written instructions for use, staying abreast of standards and guidelines, and seeking certification. Remember, everything we do is for someone else. Before I end, I want to provide my email address. So if you have um, any questions or need clarifications, you can contact me. My email address is nancy, N-A-N-C-Y dot fellows, F as in Frank, E-L-L-O-W-S as in Sam, Nancy Fellows at ASP.com. I thank you so much for joining me today and be safe. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Hi. Um, I have a couple questions that were sent my way that I'd like to share, and then I can take some live ones. 
Um, the first one was, what is the difference between a biological indicator, a BI, and a PCD, a process challenge device? And we know a biological is probably the most important sterilization monitor that we use for sterilization today. And BIs are the only sterilization monitoring device that provides a direct measure of lethality or killing of spores or other microorganisms during the process. Amy's standard 79, and, and as I was listening to my own presentation, I realized that I stated that Amy was the Association for the Advancement of Medical Information and its medical instrumentation, so I apologize for that. But Amy ST79, which is associated with steam sterilization, indicates a BI should be used with a PCD for routine sterilizer efficacy monitoring at least once a week, but preferably daily. So they speak to steam sterilization and preferably stands out. But a process challenge device or PCD contains a BI and a chemical indicator incorporated into a challenged presentation. A PCD is used to assess the effective performance of the sterilization process for by, by providing a challenge to the process that is equal or greater than the challenge posed by the most difficult item in the load. And I know I mentioned in the presentation that is particularly important because not all loads that we run in our departments are the same over and over again. Some cycles have light, light instrumentation and others may be heavier uh, in the chamber. Uh, some items are just are simple and non-critical in device where others are delicate and complicated. But Amy Standard 58 states a PCD should be used daily but preferably in every sterilization cycle. When I started um, with my profession with ASP, the conversation about every load monitoring was kind of like, you know, uh, the fish was really, really big. And now it's just gotten closer and closer to that minnow. And uh, I hear more and more people speaking about doing every load monitoring. So something to surely uh, research and have some conversation with. The other question that came through was about Spalding's classification, and it's being challenged um, now by many individuals in our healthcare delivery system. Um, we have relied on Spalding's classifications for such a long time, but there, things are changing, and some of the key organizations, such as AMI and AORN, are calling from a shift to HLD to sterilization. When we look at AMI's TIR 68, it states, Semi-critical devices come in contact with mucous membranes or non-intact skin. Users should be instructed to thoroughly clean those devices and then reprocess them by sterilization. AORN states items that are classified as a semi-critical device, such as endoscopes, should be sterilized whenever possible and un undergo HLD at a minimum if sterilization isn't possible. And then Dr. William Rutella, who is a well-known epidemiologist from Virginia states, semi-critical devices such as endoscopes and neurology devices represent the greatest risk of disease transmission because more healthcare-associated infections have been caused by reusable semi-critical than using critical or non-critical items. Uh, and of course, inadequate cleaning is the crux of, of everything because if we don't clean our devices correctly, using proper protocol and practice, then we know that we cannot high level disinfect something or we cannot sterilize it. So those are the two questions that came to me um, before I did the program. And um, I don't know if there are other questions out there. There are a few, Nancy, and thank you so much for that presentation and for addressing those couple of questions. Um, here's one that has come in. Uh, the laryngoscope should be HLD or sterilized was one of our questions. Yeah, so this is one of those devices that um, have had questions about reprocessing for years. And I believe the CDC came down um, actually several years ago now and spoke to the fact that laryngoscope blades should be sterilized. Um, my experience in the operating room was that the blades were cleaned after use. They were high level disinfected and they were not packaged. They were put back in anesthesia's drawers generally appropriate to size for pediatric intubation or adult intubation. Um, but uh, the CDC came down and said, look, you know, these devices should be not only cleaned, 
but they should be packaged for sterilization. So there have been different modalities that have been used out there from companies to help departments achieve that. Um, in my experience, some ORs have gone to single-use sterile blades used for intubation so that they do not have to be reprocessed. Again, there's another one of these devices that's considered semi-critical, but there have been questions around the clinical application and the risk for cross-contamination. There are articles about it that can you can find from the CDC and the FDA um, about how to process blades. Uh, I hope I addressed that uh, to somewhat to that person's question. Great, and our next question is, if a MIFU has sterilization parameters for pre-vacuum and gravity cycles, can these be used for SSPP sterilizers such as Statum? That's a good question. I'm not, you know, you'd have to go back to the IFU of the manufacturer for the device and look how it matches up, whether it's a gravity or non-gravity in steam sterilizer. Um, I can't really speak to steam sterilizers really well because it's not my forte, but certainly to go to an SPD manager supervisor that uses the steam sterilizer parameters, I think would be the best place for you to go to have that quest a question answered. I'm sorry, I can't give you more on that one. That's great. Thank you so much, Nancy, for a fantastic presentation. We did have a lot of requests for a copy of your presentation, so I'll be in touch with you soon about whether or not we can provide that. I'd like to encourage everyone to visit today's sponsor to learn more about the products and services that they provide to our industry. Please visit ASP.com. A quick reminder that you can obtain your CE certificate by completing today's post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed to you one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one CE hour, and you'll be able to download the certificate once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We'll be back soon with another webinar please visit ortodaywebinars.live for more details and complimentary registration. Thank you all and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.